Good morning, everyone. Uh, we hope. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so today is the first time for a public talk by Professor Ralph Wellman from uh, Austria. He is a visiting professor at Maidon University. So uh, today, the topic is about the uh, Chinese dialect, global Hakka, a non-standard dialect as a global minority language. So welcome to Professor Rapp. Thank you very much and uh, hello to everybody. Um, maybe let's start with reading one a sentence in Hakka language. Uh, you can read the glosses and the translation below. Haka fa yahe haudo hoingoi fa yinge ame fa. Haka fa tsoi si kai song haudo tifong duhe yitke sao su inyen. Kim si king it yao kong haka fa ke kin loi kin sao. So there are fewer and fewer people speaking the language, but let us start with the background, with the introduction. Um, the Hakka people live in the south of China, and uh, there are a few cultural traits, such as these uh, famous roundhouses, which sometimes are squared. Um, if you want to know more about the Hakkas, I recommend uh, 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 Leong 1985 and Leong 1997, uh, especially 1997A is a book about the Hakkas. Um, it also contains this introduction by William Skinner, who you may know also for his research in Thailand. And finally, I recommend uh, this uh, publication from 1998, Fleming Christiansen, a sociologist, about um, Hakka identity. Now, the Hakkas are a large ethnic group among the Chinese. They played an important role in revolutions and uprisings, such as the Taiping Rebellion in the 19th century. Many political leaders in the world are of Hakka uh, descent, to name but a few, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Li Kuan Yu of Singapore, uh, Corazon Aquino, most probably Sun Yat-sen, Thaksin Shinavatra, possibly Mao Zedong, but many others as well. Whether this is true or not is not our topic here, but we can see immediately that Hakka identity is a politicized construct. The Hakkas originally lived dispersed in some southern parts of China. They are said to come from northern China, as all southerners do, and they seem to have come between the third and eighth centuries uh, of Christian era. They became most numerous, or you might say dominant, in the mountainous regions between the provinces Jiangxi, Fujian, Guangdong. But they also settled in many other places, such as, to name but one, Hainan. Meijo County was soon identified as the core area of the Hakkas, for which reason the major dialect of Hakka language is also considered to be the best or the, the central dialect. Substantial numbers of Hakkas then moved on to regions such as Hunan, Hunan or Sichuan, and also to Taiwan. So I took a few images from the internet to illustrate that typically there is a north to south migration inside of China in surely several waves and the motherland, the core of Hakka 
uh, is in this area. But as I said, they moved on to other places as well. So inside of the Chinese linguistic landscape, Hakka is usually identified as this area. But uh, as I said, they are living in many other places as well. It may here be most important to also mention the situation in Taiwan, where uh, people from Fujian settled, uh, which is represented by the green color, uh, where Hokkien language is spoken, and the pink color, these are majority Hakka areas. So mostly Hakkas from Fujian also moved over to Taiwan. Uh, on the map of the, on the right side, you see the areas where there are more Hakkas in Taiwan, where you may find Hakka speakers. So this leads us to the next point to large scale out migration of Hakkas living close to the sea. They were one important group of uh, Chinese who migrated to other parts in the world. And the map below, which I found on the internet, um, is a distortion of the world in terms of how many Hakkas moved there. And you can easily find that very many Hakkas moved to Southeast Asia, uh, to this area, and uh, much fewer to Europe or to Americas. So the most important uh, place for Hakkas outside of China mainland is Taiwan and Southeast Asia, Nanyang. Um, we have tried to calculate the number of Hakkas, which is usually given with between 30 and 35 millions. And when looking at the various available data, we came up with an even higher number. This doesn't say that they all speak Hakka language, but uh, these are the people reported to identify as Hakkas. And we can see the, the greatest part is in Guangdong with millions in other provinces and overseas. So let us now speak about the Hakka identity, the question, what are actually Hakkas? Kyung Sie Fat, a researcher from Suriname, uh, says one should recognize that Hakka ethnic identity is a social construct with a surprisingly recent history, and that Kirtia, that is for him the language, is a linguistic category is less clear-cut that would seem to be the case. Let's discuss this utterance. Um, the Hakkas do not have very many peculiar cultural uh, identification markers. So they are usually defined by their own way of speaking, by speaking Hakka. Traditionally, Hakka is seen as a Sinitic language, or as the Chinese would say, a Fang Yen. Fang Yen can be translated as regional speak or speech or dialect. And these Sinitic languages or Fang Yen, such as Hakka, are not mutually understandable with other varieties. So either we should say Chinese has uh, very huge uh, dialect differences, or this is a group of closely related languages. The Hakkas themselves are not seen as an ethnic minority, but are part of the Han Chinese majority in the country, in China. Um, and this is also the view of the Hakkas themselves. And this interesting double identity Han plus Hakka um, will need more discussion here. So the Hakkas migrated south and surely met already established populations. First of all, those who spoke uh, Sinitic dialect and those who 
didn't. The Semitic groups in the south are the Teochew, Chaozhou, the Hokkien, Fujian, and the Cantonese, Guangdong. Um, they had already occupied the fertile river basins and the newcomers could mostly rent land in the mountains from the owners of this land. So they became tenants. They were reluctant to assimilate, it seems, and maintained their own culture. So what is important to know about the Hakkas, they are living at the juncture of economic macro regions, but not originally in their centers. They are between the main centers. The ethnonym Hakka uh, literally means guest families. And that is a common term in traditional China for foreigners, people who are not from here. The opposite term is Bundi or Bundi in the south, which could be translated as the locals. In the beginning, Hakka was probably a denomination of those tenants of new migrants coming to the area who were not integrated and especially not accepted by the mainstream society of the time. So Koblin comments, the Hakkas, it will be recalled, often rented upland property from lowland landlords. They in turn could sublet their lands, whereupon they became Shanchu, mountain landlords. The term Hakka, uh, Tion Sefat reports, basically means outsider. And um, so we said that already. Um, in the Ming Dynasty, the land-owning, tax-paying lineages were called autochtones, punti, and the poor, unregistered people were the alochtones, kutia or haka. So haka is originally an official classification of people, a discriminating one, one should say. It is not a regional or ethnic identity. Um, so when there were economic problems, poverty, misery, chaos, revolutions, rebellions, um, that was a reason for friction between the Hakkas, those foreigners, and the lowlanders, the Punti. And this led to an ethnic mobilization of these groups, which ended in a kind of war in a real full-blown war, I should say, between the Punti and the Hakka. So only during the 17th, um, one, um, that was the point, one um, reason for these conflicts was the following. In the 17th century, the Chinese uh, government depopulated an area of the coastline in order to prevent piracy and smuggling, and at the end of the 18th century, the area was repopulated with poor people. And these poor people were mostly Hakkas. And this greatly angered the people who previously owned that land. Um, so it was only in the 19th century, finally, that the term Hakka began to be used as an ethnic label for the inhabitants of the Jiaying County. This county does no longer exist. It has been reorganized, so we mean the Meixian area. They gained a reputation from producing many successful candidates for the imperial examinations. So they were um, educated, they were hardworking, and so on. An ethnic identity was formed by Xu Xu Zheng, um, and Possibly due to this enmity of the Punti, the self-image of the Hakkas was always closely connected to Chineseness. That was their protection to adhere themselves to the greater Chinese identity. The Punti, on the other hand, were much more independent-minded Southerners who didn't 
care so much about the North. This Puntihaka conflict, as I said, turned into a war in the middle of the 19th centuries for more than a decade. In terms of propaganda and writing, the Punti mostly commented negatively on the Hakkas, while the Hakkas mostly emphasized their good qualities and their Chineseness. And this fitted very, very well in the rising Chinese nationalism of the time. In 1905, there was another historic event. A history book for the schools claimed that the Hoklos and the Hakkas in Guangdong are not Han Chinese. And this led to a strong response from Hakka scholars. And from then on, there was a strong um, interest in proving the purity of Han Chinese descent of the Hakkas. And um, there was a second a similar event in 1920 when a foreign teacher wrote in a textbook that the Hakkas are wild, a wild and backward tribe. And this led to widespread protests among educated Hakkas, who then formed in 1921 a number of Hakka organizations. One of these organizations operates to this day the Tsongtsin Association of, of Hong Kong. Um, interestingly, this association called itself Tsongtsin and not Hakka. The term Hakka was avoided and instead a positive term was chosen. The animosity against the Hakkas um, um, uh, continued and so it happened that when, but when the Chinese government moved from the south to Nanjing, um, suddenly a number of posts were emptied and military and civil command in South China fell into the hands of Hakkas. This, of course, gave them a lot of prestige. So now this um, previously quite negative label becomes a more positive ethnic identity. The Hakkas were also no longer poor people. They emerged economically successful. And uh, so they acquired prestige. Um, furthermore, as, um, in these decades, uh, a modern standard Chinese language based on Mandarin Chinese was slowly emerging and that equalized, if you like, Cantonese language and Hakka language. They were both equally remote from this new standard. So the Punti slowly lost ground um, with respect to the Hakkas. Um, this led to a surge in interest uh, among Hakkas, Hakka intellectuals about the Hakka background, and most importantly, the book of Ruo Xianglin, 1933, which actually stated everything one can read to this day about what constitutes Hakka. They are hardy, hardworking people, and they established themselves in five phases of migration, and so on. Um, Hong Kong actually belonged to the Hakka speaking area until the British took the land, to which followed a strong migration of Punti to this new city. And they soon linguistically dominated Hong Kong. The rural areas remained Hakka speaking until quite recently. Um, the Tsung Tsin Association in Hong Kong was formed like a Hui Guan in other countries, so an association for people from the same native place. That means it was formed for Hakka migrants who came to Hong Kong. It did not at first target the Hakka inhabitants of the new territories in Hong Kong, who were farmers, not intellectuals. 
1922, the Tsongtsin Association founded a school which operated in Hakka language. Due to Japanese aggression, however, the school changed to Mandarin Chinese as medium of education in an effort to support Chinese national feeling. One other important aspect in the history of the Hakkas is the missionaries, mainly from the so-called Basel mission in Switzerland. Um, these missionaries specifically targeted Hakkas, produced a grammar and a dictionary, and a Romanized writing system. This further contributed to the emerging of an Hakka identity. In 1924, the Hakka church was officially renamed Tsungtsin Synod. The Hakka Christians are seated in Hong Kong, but spread without migration to other places, for instance, to Sabah. Um, the education of Hakkas in Christian schools possibly contributed to the modernization of China. Uh, here is the image, first page of a dictionary from 1926 by an American missionary. And one can easily see that this Chinese dictionary actually has a Hakka pronunciation and Hakka words. Um, so what can we conclude? An identity is the identification of people with an in-group. An in-group usually emerges from any kind of difference to an out-group. So typically it emerges in a conflict, which triggers the maximization of differences. So we experience a social divergence between two groups, which would be the opposite of assimilate to each other. The Hakkas, like every other group, form at a certain point in historical time on the basis of a number of factors. Long-standing discrimination as poor people, foreigners, um, an external pejorative characterization, and an opposing self-image of positive qualities. Finally, the identification with a language, Hakka language. Intellectuals then created various theories and myths about the group and researched the origin and ancestry of this group. And this provides the group with historical depth. At the same time, Hakkas both rely on an identity as Hakkas and as Chinese the latter giving them a backup in defense of local aggression. Since so many Hakkas moved to other countries, let us quickly um, mention the overseas Hakkas. They tended, as all Chinese did, to organize themselves in Huiguan, so native land associations referring to the origin of their ancestral land. Uh, usually land and spoken language were the same, except for the Hakkas, who may have lived in uh, provinces as a minority. For this reason, it is mostly the Jiaying and may, or nowadays Meixian Huiguan that were purely Hakka, whereas Hakkas from other regions may belong to a regional Huiguan where Hakka is not spoken or have a, um, a smaller type of Huiguan for themselves. Um, the Huiguan, as you may see here, do not, often not refer to Hakkanes, but to a specific geographical background. So Hakka associations coexist in various countries, serving Hakkas of different areas and different subdialects. Um, displaced Hakkas could sometimes refer to Tsungtsin from Hong Kong as their home reference or belong to another non-Hakka association. The success of the migrant, migrants who are typically without resources, protection, and are a minority in the new land, 
uh, depends very much on group solidarity. It relies on trusted person, the Srikak, for the travel, for sending money back, for bringing a spouse. They rely on the Hui Guan in the beginning for shelter, food, and for finding work. Therefore, there is a need to belong to such a group which can provide for these needs. Um, trust can be established mostly with people from the same social group. So it makes sense to um, uh, merge with the people from the same region, from the same village. For this reason, belonging to Hui Guan, um, together with a memory of ancestry, embeds the individual in an identity and a loyal social network. In modern times, such feelings get weakened very much because there is no urgent need for that. And Hui Guan are just um, traditional bodies remembering ancestry. Um, in a globalized world society, broader identifications become more important, specifically among migrants. Living as a minority in a country gives some appeal to identify with a much larger Chinese identity. Hakka is often the word applied to an ancestral identity, the roots of oneself, and Chinese is the word used for one's ethnic identity. And then thirdly, usually they have a citizenship which provides a national identity. So to give an example, one may be a Hakka by family, a Malaysian Chinese by identi ethnic identity, and a Malaysian citizen. In spite of low beginnings of the migrants as coolies, simple workers in mining and in plantations, a number of Chinese migrants, and so also Hakkas, were often quite successful in their new homelands uh, because the Chinese often took the role of a middleman minority, which means a minority which intervenes between other ethnicities and provides necessary goods for them. A self-conscious Hakkaness is an idea cult cultivated first by intellectuals and originally much less relevant to less educated people. However, subsequent generations overseas develop coarser memories of their origins, not referring to small counties or villages, but instead on a less precise, broader category. For instance, saying we are Hakkas and we are Chinese. Um, it can also be the decision of a migrant to not identify with any of these categories at all and just say, I am Dutch. Assimilation seems to be common in some countries and less common in other countries. This has to do with the cultural environment and the possibilities uh, posed uh, uh, for the migrants. Um, so Tion Siefat uh, warns uh, field workers that they risk taking Hakka as an ontological category instead of a social construct that links a vague ethnic identity with an almost equally vague linguistic category. And so they risk missing continuous processes of assimilation and language shift. Um, since the language seems to be the most important, most often mentioned identification marker for Hakkas, let us look at the language. So um, the Hakka dialect has been called unique among Semitic languages by Koblin in that the name does not associate with a particular geographical area. So actually, Hakka is then not a dialect, but a sociolect of a particular social group in society. First of all, Hakka is a Sinaitic language grammatically. It is closely related to the others. So 
for instance, let's just try to read um, maybe number four. And in Chinese, it would be So it is relatively close. Uh, if one isn't used to it, one may not understand it. Um, if we look at the phonology, there are certain um, um, input switches in phonology between the two. So, for instance, I, oi, lai, loi, yao, oi, but mai, mai, xiang, xiong, okay, lao, hu, lao, fu, lo, fu, a monophthongization sometimes, may becomes mao, uh, or equals, um, or he, ho, ge, a, go, ai, is oi, uh, but then there are words which are entirely different. Shuo is gong, a third person pronoun da is gi, and so on. So we can uh, conclude it is not immediately understandable to outsiders who know, for instance, putonghua. Um, the syntax is also a little bit different. For instance, this phrase from a Hakka speaker, a tian mian itiao ho gi tai, would be wu zi qian mian hao da yi tiao he in Chinese. So it is, um, in a way, an independent language. There are, as we saw, at least 30 million Hakkas if not 50 million, and many of them speak Hakka, so it has, of course, different dialects. And dialects typically form a dialect continuum, um, where we can see that dialects in the north are most similar to Gan language, and in the east are most similar to Fujian language, and in the south are most similar to Chaozhou language, and in the west, closest to Cantonese. So actually, maybe there are not clear-cut um, borders between these languages. Uh, rather, we identify this cluster of dialects as one language for historical reasons. Um, to, to look at the dialects, I refer to Koblin 2019, uh, who gives uh, many uh, word, many words in various dialects, and um, so that one can see the range of variation that there is. Um, as I said, Hakka is also spoken in scattered places. Um, all over southern China, and that, of course, makes us classified as a sociolect. If we compare Hakka to the other South Sinitic languages, just to have an idea, so the sentence here is uh, from Malaysia, therefore it contains a Malay loanword, Hutang. So the Hakka would say, Kyu bai ngat yo hi tsapfot yam mai dung si. And then you must continue here. Hey, you dead or dange. So previously, when we went to buy goods, we could uh, we could um, um, owe the money. And in Cantonese, it would be gao bai ngo de. I don't dare read Cantonese actually. Gao bai ngo de hei jap fo dim mai. Uh, it is pretty similar to this uh, Maysian way of speaking. Uh, uh, Hokkien would be slightly more different, but again, it has the same syntactic structure and one could train to learn it quickly. And in Malaysian Mandarin, um, it would be basically the same syntax and the same loan words which of course are not used in uh, mainland China. So this as a, as a comparison. For the research history, I mentioned already the missionary linguistics, for instance, in 2005, 
the grammar of the Basel mission was re-edited and is available online. Uh, the first grammatical description was done by Hashimoto in 1973, based on one Meishian speaker in Japan. Um, as grammar of Hakka, I would refer to He Gong Yong, but this is written in Chinese language. Um, and then finally, Hakka has a stand in uh, historical linguistics where uh, comparison of the different Sinetic languages is undertaken. Because uh, one might say that Hakka represents to some degree a somewhat older layer of uh, Chinese pronunciation. Um, what is the linguistic value of studying a language such as Hakka? Actually, um, one might show in the non-standard languages how grammar diverge for, diverges from modern standard languages, which often were formed in the image of other standard languages. So there is a discussion how much uh, Putonghua is influenced by English or Western grammatical traditions. Uh, or it has developed its own form. For instance, this bar construction, Bacho uh, uh, I sold the car, which uh, does not exist in Hakka. And the Hakkas would say something like, Ata, my hoigi, but A is a demonstrative, or a t different um, construction with serial verbs, Tana, loi, my hoigi. Um, there are a few word, verbs which can be used similar to ba, among them jiong, which of course is the literate Chinese jiang. Um, so I, I cannot go into that here more, but I think the linguistic value of any smaller non-standard language is to see how uh, the original natural development of language took place, whereas standard languages are have experienced some intervention. The Hakka language is virtually identical to the way the Shu are speaking Chinese. So while um, there is a separate grammar for the Shu language, um, it is equally usable to learn about the Hakka dialects in China. Mm. The Shu are a Hmongic or Mianic uh, language. As you can see, uh, this language is spoken in an area where the Hakkas uh, form the majority of people. And because of that, um, this happened. So we could easily, one can really uh, mostly rely on when reading Shu Yu that uh, this is mostly identical with what the Hakkas in the same region are speaking. Now to the political dimension again. Uh, in uh, the People's Republic of China, one might summarize that the Hakkas are not um, an important factor. Um, they are nowadays recognized as a sub-ethnic group, so a subgroup of the um, of the Han Chinese, and there is a, a humanities tradition of doing Hakkaology research, research on Hakkas. So it is now a culture in its own right, and it sees itself as an important, if not central, aspect of Han culture. This is, of course, a retrograde view of how Chinese used to be. Chinese culture used to be. Um, in the Republic of China or Taiwan, uh, the Taiwanese Hakka have formed their own Taiwanese identity. They are, after all, living there since 300 years, and they have experienced a number of political changes which uh, separate them from the experience on the mainland. In 1895, the Japanese Empire integrated Taiwan into its territory. The population, consisting of a majority of Hokkien, a, a huge minority of Hakkas, 
and Austronesian speakers were basically Japanized. Their languages gradually abolished and the languages also took very many Japanese loan words. In uh, 1945, Taiwan was then taken by the Kuomintang government coming from mainland China and 14% of the population now arrived from mainland China. Many of these people also Hakkas, but they are not counted among the so-called Taiwanese Hakkas. The KMT dictatorship now did the opposite. They sinicized the island and also forbade the use of any other language, uh, mostly because uh, these languages were so much influenced by Japanese already. So the KMT very much acted like an occupying force in Taiwan, keeping all political key positions for themselves, ruling with military law, having a prison island, and so on. In this time, Guoyu, Mandarin Chinese standard, was the sole language of the country. With democratization from beginning in 89, um, First, the Hokkien speakers demanded language rights and presented their language as Taiwanese, Taigi. Uh, this triggered Hakka movements, who also wanted to be seen as Taiwanese. And these efforts were followed by Aboriginal groups who were also demanding language rights. These rights were actually granted, and uh, the Republic of China or Taiwan recognizes now Kuo Yu, Hokkien, Hakka, as well as 16 Austronesian languages as the multilingual heritage of Taiwan. With the Hakka Basic Law in 2018, and the Hakka President Tsai Ing-wen, um, Hakka became, one, uh, became uh, one of the national languages. Um, so this is a very different identity of Taiwanese Hakka, uh, which sometimes leads to kind of misunderstanding with other Hakkas in the world, because the aims are somewhat different. Um, finally, for all the other Hakkas in the world, uh, the Hakka identity became important in a term which we might call global Hakka, the Tsungtsin associations, as well as Versada Huiguan, and the, finally the World Hakka Conference, which takes place biannually, creates a global network, a powerful network and infrastructure for overseas Chinese. So this is very much business related. Uh, here on the image, we see the president of the Tsungtsin Association of Netherlands. Uh, with uh, close contacts to Hong Kong and Shenzhen and so on. Um, so to summarize, Hakka identity may have mostly lost the language in the meantime, because it is a minority language, and many aspects of its culture have disappeared. For instance, the mountain songs are not sung in other countries, but uh, an idea of Hakkaness has emerged which has become a global lab label, which can help individuals to feel connected and also to collaborate in a global network of interest groups. Um, yeah. So let us now look at a few situations of hackers in the world. Uh, we did qualitative open interviews, conversations, participant observation with Hakka individuals in various countries in the last years um, until 23, I should write here. Um, didn't read carefully the text. Uh, the aims of this investigation is first of all the linguistic interest of documentation of uh, Hakka language and Hakka groups and in the context of global hacker studies, of migration studies, uh, and so on. And the observance of intergenerational language maintenance or language abandonment in uh, migratory situations. Um, and of course, questions of identity as just discussed. 
In mainland China, Hakka is surely spoken by many people, for instance, in the Mexican area. But as far as I can tell from very little exposure, the Hakka language has uh, gotten a Putonghua pronunciation. So it is influenced now by the general education in Putonghua language. Um, Hakka, yeah. So we may expect that Hakka, even in the in its own homeland, may get weakened over time, and that Putonghua may eventually take over, and there might be an intermediary step where Hakka becomes uh, more and more similar to the standard language. As I said, Hong Kong was previously a Hakka-speaking area. Now it has mostly become a Cantonese-speaking area, and only very old people in the new territory still speak Hakka. Lao Chun Fat in Hong Kong is uh, the person to refer to who uh, investigates uh, Hakka in the world, but specifically in Hong Kong. Um, in um, Shenzhen, Hakka was spoken, but with the enormous growth of the city, Putonghua, not even Cantonese, became the main language. And some old people in the vicinity of these areas speak mixed varieties, uh, where it is somewhat difficult to say, is this Cantonese or Hakka? Uh, it is something in between, or, or some Cantonese heavily influenced by Hakka, or the other way around. Um, and it has been reported that scattered Hakka groups in Sichuan and so on basically don't speak Hakka anymore, which is uh, reasonable to believe. Um, so um, traditionally, we can see that in uh, Guangxi province, the Hakkas mostly live here in the south. In uh, um, uh, Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, this here is Guangdong province. So it is mostly in the east of the Guangdong province. Uh, and this here is Jiangxi, Jiangxi um, in the south of Jiangxi. These are 9 million speakers. And finally, in Hokkien, Fujian province uh, here in this part. So these are the core areas where Hakka is spoken. And it is, as we can see, most widespread in, in Guangdong province, even in the west of the province, uh, touching Guangxi province. So uh, the language in Taiwan, 14 to 16 percent of the population are actually Hakkas in Taiwan. Um, I mentioned that already. Um, all these languages in Taiwan are very much supported by uh, language policies, and there is a Hakka College in Taoyuan, College of Hakka Studies, uh, belonging to the National uh, Chinese Normal University in Taoyuan. Um, and there is a global Hakka consortium uh, with Chang Wei An and uh, others. So here, basically, we have uh, Hakka researchers from uh, Taiwan. And uh, this is um, very much researched and uh, taken care of. I mentioned already the law granting uh, the rights to Hakka and to other and other laws granting rights to other ethnic groups of Taiwan. We can see that Hakka is sometimes used in a kind of romanization here. In the streets of Taipei, we can read Hakka Choi Yong Sang Ye. So it is now, after a long period of discrimination, it is now cherished by society. And it has become kind of a tourist attraction. So um, you may read this is a Hakka town and uh, a lot of Hakka related things which you can buy or visit. Um, many Hakkas in the 
course of history have actually changed their language and they are called Hoklo Kek. So these are Kek, Hakas, who speak Hoklo language. Uh, this may be another two million people or so. Um, later migration brought Hakas from other countries to Taiwan. Uh, for instance, there is a small quarter of Taipei, a few streets where uh, Burmese Hakas live. Here you can read Burmese script, for example. And um, these people report uh, that they speak Burmese to this day. So it's not necessarily Hakka, only some old people speak Hakka, but even the young people serve their customers in Burmese language, and there are Burmese monks and so on in this area. They are not included in this uh, Taiwanese Hakka identity, one must add. Um, it is reported in the literature that Hakka people use significantly more Mandarin with their children than Hakka. And this is worse for Hakka than, for instance, for Hoklo language, which is still uh, used by the people. We have interviewed people in Taiwan, and we got um, comments like this. A woman is asked whether she spoke Hakka or whether her children can still speak Hakka, and she answers, Na sing in voi. My uh, children can. And then she continues in Chinese, in wei wo hui qiang bo, because I forced them. Wo hui gan ta qiang, I spoke with them. Ti yit ki ki tang sit, haka again. Ni qiang shu ma, the child asks, what are you saying? Ting bu dong. So she, she paints this picture of uh, a primarily uh, Chinese, uh, as a socialized child, and she's speaking Hakka to her child. Yeah, um, There is a huge, possibly a huge amount of dialect leveling, so Hakka becomes very similar to uh, Woyu. Um, so when we ask people to translate into Hakka, they might say, Tintian, uh, Tintian, they translate, Kimbungit, Tintian. And that is, of course, completely the same structure as in Guoyu. And um, my uh, colleague uh, from Malaysia would say, uh, we would say, Kimgit Mountain Loi. We would speak differently yeah? uh, in Hakka. So we might assume that uh, Taiwanese Hakka is more influenced by Guoyu uh, than uh, other types of Hakka. And uh, the speakers sometimes didn't no longer have the habit of speaking Hakka, also it was the heritage language, and so it was a little bit difficult for them to speak Hakka with us. So this woman said, Liadyung in Hak, Liadyu Yoka, so she's looking for a word for tourist in Hakka, no? Jusu loi liawe nin Hak, Yokama. So she translates again, yeah. And then she said, 全部都是来自中国的. And then we discussed with her that she uses uh, Chinese in her Hakka. And she insists that 都是,那就都是啊, we say 都是, uh, 全部, long, long, that's Hokkien, uh, 都共融是, that would be Hakka. So, <laughs> um, so uh, some speakers really had trouble remembering the Hakka language for us. So, um, but nowadays everybody mentions that uh, in earlier times they didn't dare to speak Hakka and now it is, uh, it is fine and maybe we can revive it. Um, people dare to speak more Hakka. But it was actually difficult to hear Hakka in the streets. We tried hard. Um, okay. Um, many people may be less aware that in South America, there is one country where Hakka plays an important role, which is Suriname. Suriname used to be a colony of uh, the Netherlands. Uh, it has gained independence in the last decades. And um, it's not huge numbers. But where do I have the numbers here? 
uh, you see it's, uh, 8,000 people roughly, uh, but uh, Hakka is an important language there, which is uh, so far maintained by the speakers. The entire country has 600,000 inhabitants, and one should say it is basically one town and a lot of jungle. So uh, that's the situation. Uh, the Hakkas are having grocery shops and similar, and um, seem to speak Hakka. Um, of course, the language is um, on the one hand old fashioned and on the other hand um, influenced by uh, Dutch and, Tan and Sranantongo, the local Creole. And in modern times, a huge amount, I mean, comparably, a huge amount of uh, people from Zhejiang moved to Suriname and outnumbered the Hakkas. And these people uh, tend to speak or aim for Putonghua. So the language situation has recently changed a lot. Uh, when we have talked to Hakkas from Suriname, they usually were not afraid of language loss so far because it is spoken in the families. Um, for instance, uh, it is reported that the Hakka speaker in Suriname says, Gin ha zu hei ngai tuk dao su. Am I study? Yeah. And um, this seems to be an influence from Dutch, van dag ben ik, this inversion in Germanic languages, an het studeren. Yeah. So, of course, the language is influenced to some degree by its uh, environment. Um, this man living in uh, The Hague in the Netherlands, Chinawen, uh, is the author of a very voluminous dictionary of Hakka words, uh, which he collected uh, because he feared that the language will disappear and he wanted to keep the memory. Uh, this book is very much cherished by the Tsungtsin Association in the Netherlands as a uh, um, testimony of their uh, heritage. Um, so nowadays, uh, the church young people are outnumbering the Hakkas, and so this might be the beginning of the end of Hakka language in uh, Suriname, but this has not yet happened. Um, as in so many other Huiguan, we can see this here. Could you have spoken at the monthly general meetings? Uh, but certain people, wait, uh, no, that's not what I wanted to say. In many Huiguan nowadays, um, the language is shifted to Putonghua or Malaysian Mandarin or however this is called because the younger people are not good enough in Hakka language. And while in the old Hakka still learned to read Chinese in Hakka pronunciation, for young people this is an odd proposal if we ask them whether they can read Chinese letters, Chinese characters, in Hakka pronunciation. So here we see a shift um, globally to uh, Chinese. Um, we have visited only Singkawang in Indonesia. So uh, this is restricted to this one town where the Hakkas seem to be a majority. And even Hokkien settlers uh, were able to speak Hakka. So Hakka is the main language for the Chinese people there. And um, the children still learn uh, Hakka because Chinese is basically lacking. But again, there are language shifts in the plural. Uh, the wealthier people have uh, um, Indonesian housemaids and the children learn uh, Indonesian. The poor people speak Hakka at home and the children have difficulty at school for not speaking Indonesian language. And this was perceived as a problem. So speaking Hakka was not uh, the thing the people were aiming at. 
it was actually, they were aiming at speaking Indonesian. And then they formed a kindergarten where one kindergarten caretaker had been to Taiwan to learn Guoyu, and she is supposed to teach the children standard Chinese. So <laughs> this was the situation uh, uh, between the generations at that time. Um, uh, yeah, I said that already. And then we asked, uh, for instance, uh, how, how would you say Dong Wu? Yeah? And she said Dong Wu, but mm, the children wouldn't understand that. So we say Binatang or Haiwan, so Indonesian words. So, of course, Indonesian influences the Hakka of this place. Uh, here, another sentence, Ki Tolong Ina, so he helped people. Tolong is Indonesian. <clears throat> um, there are also hackers in East Timor, which is a separate country, but close by. Um, and this is researched by, now I cannot think of the name, by a Swiss researcher in Berlin. Uh, so these are, I don't know, several thousand people. One place where Hakka is very important is Saba in East Malaysia, province in East Malaysia, uh, on the island of Borneo. Um, they are the majority Chinese population there, and Hakka served as a local <laughs> lingua franca, so it is also known by non Hakkas. And since the migrants in the f beginning were most were exclusively men, and it was obviously difficult to bring uh, women, wives, spouses from China, um, many Hakkas married uh, Kadasantuzun people, and this led to a new mixed ethnic identity of Sino Kadasan, who speak Hakka, not all, but many speak Hakka. Uh, are maybe Taoist, Buddhist, or Christian, um, consider themselves to be Hakkas, um, but uh, look somewhat different from uh, the from other Chinese. In Saba, there is a religious divide between Buddhist, Taoist people and uh, Christians, a uh, divide in the sense of language. The Buddhist Hakkas seem to be more oriented towards standard Chinese. They invite monks from Taiwan, these monks speak Guo Yu, and so on. The Christian Hakkas, as I mentioned before, they got socialized in a standard Hakka language and a Hakka translation of the Bible and so forth. So they are fully literate in Hakka and they also speak a very good Hakka. Um, they insisted that all in the community are able to speak Hakka. Ah, sorry, this is the Buddhist. The Buddhist um, mentions one other aspect which endangers languages. Everybody is moving around, getting higher education, going to other countries, living in Hong Kong and Australia and so forth. And so it is very improbable that these Hakka speakers um, will continue the Hakka language in these new places. Um, so many uh, grandparents report something like this. Uh, the children speak only Cantonese, but when I go there, I would speak Hakka with them. This short, tiny exposure of ha to Hakka will certainly not change the children, but there is some idea of um, um, transferring the Hakka language as an identity marker. This is a more symbolic use of the language, not the really communicative use. The sino Kadasan speakers reported similarly that on the one hand, here's a picture of a sino Kadasan man. Uh, they consider themselves completely the same. They're both Hakkas, but you can see ethnically, um, here is some Sabahan genetics involved. Um, that um, on the one hand, Hakka is still even used in the schoolyard, 
But on the other hand, uh, Chinese and uh, Malay and English are becoming more and more important to the young people. Um, there is a pop star in Saba who sings, for instance, uh, a song called I Love Sino Kadasan. So he falls in love with a Sino Kadasan girl. And this is sung in Hakka language with uh, Kadasan Dusun uh, code switching. And here's a Chinese translation of the Kadasan text. I love her. Yeah. And uh, the same song also contains English words. For instance, here he sings local he, local gay product. Yeah? So that's the way Hakka and all the other languages are used uh, in Malaysia, basically. Now, quickly to the Christians. Um, they, as I said before, still speak the Hakka language. They are a little bit separate from everybody else in some village. And um, even the children speak Hakka. The Cantonese husband um, also had to learn Hakka. So Hakka is going strong in this rather enclosed uh, religious community. The church service is in Hakka language. Um, and when asked who will the children marry, will they marry a Hakka? The answer is, I hope that the spouse is a Christian. So that is more important, specifically living in an Islamic country. Um, now, quickly to West Malaysia, including Singapore, there are basically three uh, routes in the country. The Tin route comes from Malacca, northwards Ipoh, Penang, until Phuket. This is tin mining area. And there is a less important gold route where they were following finds of gold across the Cameron Highlands to northeast. And then when the British built the railway, many Hakka towns were founded along the way every 50 kilometers or so. And so they used to be Hakka majorities for some time, no longer today, but for some time. I added here, maybe one cannot see it well, this is the Google map of south of Ipo and all these little lakes here. These are traces of tin mining. So uh, here one can, one can see uh, the tin mining. And uh, that is a traditional job of Hakkas in Malacca. This is a quite recent picture. Um, so the Hakkas in Malaysia are approximately 1 million people, the second largest Chinese group. And the Chinese uh, are approximately 26, maybe less now, 23% of the population. Um, they used to be up to 30% in the country in olden times. Um, this, the all Chinese languages are, are spoken in the west of West Malaysia and not, oh, sorry, um, I mean, there are many Hakkas in East Malaysia that we have established and in West Malaysia and the peninsula, they live mostly in, um, if I may include Singapore, Malacca, Penang, Kuala Lumpur, Ipoh, so in the bigger uh, urban areas whereas countryside may be uh, more um, Malay. Um, Hakka, yeah, I mentioned that. Um, in a study of one extended family and uh, absolutely in line with other studies, we found that the people in a family below 20 years of age do not actively speak Hakka and the adults between 20 and 35 maybe are in this area are weak speakers. They can speak Hakka if they have to, but they usually don't. The fully competent speakers are above age 15 now today. Um, which reasons are there? First of all, there is a high amount of inter-ethnic marriages. So being Hakka is not... Uh, 
the parameter for marrying. And uh, mass media are completely in Guoyu, uh, Malay, English, or Cantonese, but there is not much in Hakka, and if so, it is often a little bit outdated. There are a few singers, like the person mentioned before, who sometimes sings in Hakka language. And finally, the adults have linguistic aspirations towards the great international languages and not towards Hakka. So they report, I want my children to speak pure Chinese, not even Malaysian Mandarin, but mainland China Mandarin. So uh, there is a huge interest in education and in speaking the, the language which is most useful in terms of economy and education. What is interesting is that um, kinship terms in the family were still used in Hakka in spite of speaking Mandarin to the children. So one might say a sentence like That's quite interesting. Uh, in other parts of the world, we also always ask for the kinship or listen to kinship terminology. And for instance, the Hakka children in Europe are unaware of the complex kinship system of Chinese and will say uncle, auntie, for instance, in German, and not distinguish the different types of uncles and aunties. Um, so many people decided to speak only Mandarin with their children, and this we can call language abandonment. The language is given up in favor of a more useful communicative tool. There is no linguistic ideology involved in uh, a need to maintain uh, the heritage language. Um, actually, this need to maintain that heritage language surfaces more when the language becomes very scarce. So in areas where almost nobody ever speaks Hakka, then old people may sometimes regret the loss of the language but not in an area where any everybody can speak Hakka anyway, they don't care. And of course, that is exactly what you find in any other linguistic society. Uh, the languages are no longer transmitted, is reported everywhere. You see, as Sabahan tells us, uh, she lives in West Malaysia, her children cannot speak good Hakka, and look how he says it. And the dark pink color indicates Malay words in his Hakka, um, which is another interesting factor each time one speaks uh, with uh, people in non-standard languages or dialects. Um, often, sometimes a speaker is quite purist, but uses the forms he dislikes himself all the time. So uh, we can say that a huge amount of literature now shows us that South Sinitic vernaculars previously spoken by all ethnic Chinese in Malaysia are given up. And um, the, uh, of course, uh, some activists or linguists may think about revitalization, but this is not what ordinary people report. They are basically not interested in that. Um, well, old people may sometimes slightly regret the loss. Um, so, of course, uh, so we can also say that um, the Chinese in Malaysia are not just assimilated to becoming Malays because that is basically not possible due to the state ideology and the religious divide and so on. Uh, but they have an, another important tool at hand, which is standard Chinese. And standard Chinese was not only very successful in China and Taiwan, it is very successful all over the world among ethnic Chinese. 
But this, of course, uh, may indicate the end of languages such as Hakka in the long run. Um, in Singapore, there were active language policies against the dialects. And uh, I just remember talking to a Singaporean Hakka who told me that um, uh, this speak Mandarin campaign happened shortly before she was learning to speak. And she is the only person in her family who cannot speak Hakka because of that. <laughs> so the family indeed shifted to Mandarin. Equally, there was a speak good English movement targeted against the Malay, the English vernacular spoken in the area. Um, so basically, Singapore has become an English speaking country uh, where the people have hold the opinion that their mother tongue, even if they don't speak it, is Chinese. But the country is English speaking. Um, and of course, Malaysians specifically spread all over the world, and uh, one can meet them in any other place. Big, yeah, they, they have the ability and also the interest to move to other countries. Now, Thailand, you may know about that, but I include it nonetheless. Again, the Hakkas are the second largest Chinese group, but they are outnumbered by the Chow Chow by far. And uh, it seems to me that most or many Hakkas in Thailand are from the Bansang Hak group um, and much fewer from other places. And uh, they are not completely uniform. So in Bangkok, uh, most arrived, it seems, if I may summarize that, uh, in Bangkok and then moved to other places, for instance, Chiang Mai. Um, then there is a traditional um, um, group coming from the south, from Malaya to Phuket. And then finally, in the Malaysia-Thailand borderland, there are quite a few Hakkas and they very often or sometimes have a connection to Malaya coming from Penang area. Um, why did they come there? For Phuket, of course, it was tin mining in the beginning. And for the borderland, it was rubber plantations mostly. And um, the fact that these were basically wild lands which were free to, to use. Um, and Bangkok, of course, uh, it is more this urban uh, middleman minority migration. Um, all these migrations, uh, both in Malaysia and in Thailand and any other country, actually increased very much in the second half of the 20th century. So it is basically a very new movement. It's only two or four generations ago, which is the reason why we still find Hakka in other countries, because after three or four generations, usually it's gone. Um, in Thailand, one can see that except for heritage speakers, uh, Hakka is no longer used by um, the Thai, Chinese Thai citizens. Um, only older people are able to speak with very few notable exceptions. Uh, especially the nationalistic phase in the 1930s spread standard Thai as the language for all people, and this effectively replaced many other linguistic situations, including Hakka language. Um, there are various Hui Guan in Thailand as well, um, which take care of the interests of their regional groups. Maybe one might mention that a Hakka from La Réunion, so a French citizen, with his Thai wife, founded this uh, luxury restaurant Tulo uh, in Chiang Mai, which uh, has to, which deals with um, Hakka cuisine and um, a Hakka image, and um, provides. Um, a Hakka identity in a very powerful way. Um, this shows again this um, usefulness of the Hakka identity in an international, global, economic, 
economically oriented uh, framework. Um, for Phuket, one might also mention the Sino-Portuguese architectural style, which derives uh, visibly from Portuguese occupation of Malacca and then Penang. Uh, so it was transferred by Chinese settlers. In uh, Phuket, uh, we could never find any Hakka speaker, but there is a Hakka Hoi Guan. Um, the, that's because the, the, the settlers there uh, are already long time settlers in the area, so the language may not have survived to this day. Um, in the borderland, Hatiai Betong Sadao, mostly known for rubber plantations and durian plantations and so on, um, uh, there are many people who are second, third generation and still speak Hakka language, uh, especially in the in the villages. Um, both the Kuomintang and the communists um, led to some influx of Chinese people into Thailand. In the north, uh, there are villages of former KMT. And in the south, we have these uh, Malaysian People's Liberation Army uh, camps in the jungle. And these people have now been integrated in society. Some of them are Hakkas. Um, the Chinese Thai, one could say, are much more assimilated to Thai culture uh, than uh, the Malaysian Hak uh, Chinese. Uh, so there is no barrier between the Chinese people and the uh, uh, Thai style Buddhism and so on. Um, so actually, uh, Thailand has a relatively strong Thai monolingualism with which is certainly useful for the economy and at the same time uh, is kind of a hindrance to learning more English as a lingua franca, which is only necessary in, maybe in tourism, increasingly certainly in, in the industry. Um, on the other hand, in Malaysia and Singapore, uh, Malay is uh, not adopted with uh, enthusiasm because the ethnic Chinese um, hold the view this is only a local language, uh, whereas English and Chinese, that is really useful in the world. Um, very short comment on Burma. Uh, it seems that most Chinese have left Burma by now. Um, and so one finds Burmese Hakka, for instance, in Taiwan, as I said, this man is uh, from Burma, living in Taipei. And in India, there are even Chinese groups scattered across the country, including Pakistan. But these groups are all very small, like 15 families in a big city, something like that. The biggest group seems to have been in Calcutta. There were maybe, it's very difficult to give numbers, maybe 8,000, maybe 20,000 Hakkas, and then also thousands of Cantonese and other groups. Um, living in a multilingual city where no single group can completely dominate all others, and becoming actually quite wealthy there. Hakka was maintained as a language, and there are YouTube videos which are considered to be funny because Indian people speak Hakka language. Because if they worked for Hakkas, they would inevitably pick up some Hakka. Um, so this used to be a big group, but due to the conflicts between China and India, the situation worsened over time. And then a new generation, uh, from beginning in the 1970s, you could say, decided to migrate. And most of them seem to have moved to Toronto, Canada. And there is one bigger group in Vienna, Austria, and we met Hakkas from India in Taiwan as well. So 
now they are going everywhere. They are usually able to speak Hakka even when they are, for instance, 20 years old. Um, nonetheless, nowadays for them, English is most important. They sometimes show the uh, in disinterest in trying to speak Hindi and so on. They didn't care. So that is the situation of the Indian Hakkas. As I said, that's mostly old people are still there. Uh, now let's come to Europe, and I think this might be the last group I'm going to speak about. First of all, the Hakkas as such are never mentioned in the literature. There's a lot of literature about the Chinese in Europe. So let me first say a few sentences about that. Uh, the Chinese came to London, for instance, already in the 19th century, but disappeared in society by marrying English uh, wives and becoming English. Then they came again in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, mostly so either by ship to France and UK or by land across Russia to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, to the German Empire. And I mean, these were not millions, but at least several thousands. And they established already Chinese restaurants in Berlin, or Vienna, and so on. And they all disappeared uh, due to the uh, economic crisis in the 20s and then Second World War. That was not their war, so they <laughs> moved away. And um, several thousands moved down to Spain because that was not involved in the war. So basically, Chinese migration had to start from the beginning after Second World War. And uh, then they came uh, mostly by airplane. In the 70s, it was easy. And then the politics more and more made it difficult for, for uh, foreigners to come to Europe. However, it was always difficult for people from People's Republic of China because Europe had an anti communist uh, uh, position. So most hackers in the beginning came from Hong Kong, for instance, to the Netherlands, or from India to Austria. So they came from another country already. In the Netherlands, since they held colonies, um, people from Indonesia, from Suriname, and then also increasingly from Hong Kong arrived there. Um, only when uh, China opened up after 1989, 1990s, then uh, many people from China, from China came. And while the first Chinese who came from other countries were often Hakkas, Cantonese, something like that, now the new group mostly came from Zhejiang. So for some reason, basically from two towns in Zhejiang, all the migrants, mm -hmm. <laughs> all Chinese migrants in the world uh, come from that area. Um, in the Netherlands, there is a strong, big Benelux Tsongtsin Hakka Association. <laughs> and um, um, this consists of businessmen, politicians, and so on. The Hakkas are quite well integrated into Dutch society. Uh, holding uh, important positions. Of course, they are by far not as numerous as they are in Asian countries, but uh, there are some. Um, the estimates vary greatly. Um, here in the Thai book, they say there are 1,000 Hakkas in the Netherlands, and in the Malacca publication, they say 2,000, and the people in, in Holland would say are 10,000 or 20,000. That might be too high. But it is maybe more than 1,000. Yeah, one cannot count them. It's impossible. Uh, Benelux, by the way, is an abbreviation for Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. Um, there are many contacts between these countries, uh, but most are actually in the Netherlands. Um, we did an, a quantitative investigation there, 
and we managed to ask roughly 200 people about their language use. That's still not very much, but uh, that, that was hard work. Um, and we can say, wait a moment, I'm, I need to understand my own numbers. What is this? Um, yeah, how many of these people say they are good in, in Hakka? 71, good in Chinese, 74. Good in Cantonese, 84. Only hackers have been asked. So one point to take home, most of the hackers in the Netherlands speak Cantonese because they are from Hong Kong. And even those who speak Hakka speak Cantonese in the Tsungtsin Association. So that's interesting. They see a language shift from Hakka to Cantonese in Holland. <laughs> Um, and when we asked about how well do you speak Hakka, then you see the oldest group, very old people, say they speak Hakka very well. And you see the old people still quite good. And then the middle-aged people, yeah, not so good. And the young people, um, which were not many and some were enthusiastic, so they still speak some Hakka but they consider themselves almost as uh, uh, close to not at all. On the other hand, uh, what about uh, Chinese? It also decreases to the young generation and uh, Cantonese remains the same. So Cantonese is often the language even the young people know. Uh, English wasn't known by the very old people. Now almost everybody speaks English. And similarly, they are not that good in Dutch if they are very old. And all young people, of course, are almost all are competent speakers of Dutch. So one means very good, five means not at all. Here, yeah. This is a self-assessment, what people think about their own language competence. As I said, in Austria, there are mostly two groups, the Indian Hakkas and the Taiwanese Hakkas, and then, of course, scattered across Malaysian and other origins. Um, this is the CF family in Vienna with the now oldest Hakka lady, 96 years old. Her 100-year-old husband just passed away. Um, and... Uh, she was born in Meijo and then moved to India for 40 years and then came to uh, Austria for the rest of her life. She doesn't speak one word of German. So she basically speaks Hakka. But since she's listening to Chinese television, she seems to pick up Putonghua nowadays. The parents, of course, they speak Hakka uh, with each other. They are all from India, born in India, and they, and their children can speak Hakka. They are now young adults. And one even got a Hakka girlfriend. <laughs> but uh, they speak German with each other. So that is the course of events. Uh, just as one example. Huh? Usually they have uh, Chinese restaurants. That is an ethnic profession for uh, for Chinese um, because they cannot speak the language well when the, the first generation migrants. So they are somewhat barred from getting any office job. Uh, one group of hackers didn't want to go into gastronomy and they managed to enter the post service. So there was a whole group of fire workers at the post central office yeah. in Vienna. There is uh, there exist only our publications about these hackers, uh, but they um, connect to the research, more extensive research on the Indian hackers. Yeah. And we participate, we contributed, participated to the foundation of the so-called Austrian Hakka Association, <laughs> kind of Hui Guan. Uh, I should say, we have managed to count the people. It is more than 530 people. 
So it's not that much, after all, in comparison to the world. So, yeah, roughly for 540 people. What is also interesting with that group is that they speak all Hindi, and that's why they can employ Indians for their takeaway services. <laughs> um, but the young people don't learn that. So even an 18-year-old Hakka speaker in Vienna was able to communicate in Hakka. Uh, so she answered, what is your most comfortable language? And she said, um, Tetwun, dann he ngai yi chung yi English, ngai ya chung yi gong. Dann he Hakka fa chiu ngai tung nga mami papi gong. I speak Hakka only with my parents. Um, what is interesting here, cannot see here, uh, she seems to not have any tone differences. So it sounds like Austrian German when she speaks Hakka. Her brother, on the other hand, he understands, but he always answers in German. He doesn't attempt to speak Hakka. Um, so uh, in Canada, because they are all related to some people in Canada, uh, in Canada, the youth does not speak uh, Hakka anymore because these people were English speaking from India and they could immediately um, adapt to uh, English in Canada. Um, and we asked the young people which language they are using with their peers in India and in Canada, and they end up using English, although they could speak Hakka with the Indian uh, cousins. Uh, but mostly they use English. And, um, yeah, um, in terms of identity, it is interesting that this group is quite proud to be Hakka because they are a very enclosed group. They do not usually have many friends outside of that group, which made them speak Hakka all their lives in Vienna, Austria. And But when you dig deeper, you may find out that Hakka for them means mostly clearly their own group, just those Indian Hakkas in three places, in India, in Vienna, and in Canada. So, of course, a word such as Hakka can mean different things. And they don't have the head for speaking about global Hakka or... <laughs> an idea, or they, they don't feel connected to China. Their culture is Indian. They like Indian food. They cook Indian style, and so on. Um, and uh, when we ask the people about um, how do you actually transmit a Hakka or Chinese culture, then um, the parents say uh, they don't talk about it. They have European mentality and the children complained that they never got any explanation. So <laughs> very clearly there was a lack of communication about this identity, which is why the young people are quite interested in talking to us because we can explain to them what actually is Hakka. <laughs> they didn't know. They know they are Hakkas, but that's all. And here I don't want to read all of that. This man explains to us in English with German words and Hindi words and English words in his Hakka. <laughs> How was his situation? So this is the way he was speaking. You see, half of it was English, half of it was Hakka. And it is, uh, and there are many German and English and even Hindi words in his speech. Uh, Kali is not aware that we don't understand that. So other words he may not use for us. So uh, that's the situation. Um, here is a party of the, here you can read Hakka, of the Taiwanese Hakkas in uh, Vienna. Let me come to a conclusion and maybe I don't repeat myself again and again. So uh, just very few words. Um, I think Hakka uh, is an example of uh, the problem of what actually is an identity. It can be all, kind, all kinds of things. 
uh, how identity develops and uh, also changes its uh, form over time. And um, very often, and we shouldn't make the mistake of uh, having a retrograde view all the time at this identity and force people <laughs> to to live in an older imagined hackerness if they don't want to. And so these are the points I wanted to make. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to discuss with you. Okay, thank you so much. It's really fantastic. <laughs> okay, have anyone uh, would like to comment or recommend? Okay, thank you for your uh, wonderful talk because I is I mean I acknowledge a much about Hakka because uh before I used to interview them in in the southern part as the uh, part of the memory about the uh, the Cold War uh and how how do they have uh any impact on their life in in the southern part of Thailand uh but uh, when I I I interview the Hakka, they, right now they have the association and they feel like in the past, uh, when their, their father or grandfather, they, they still can speak uh, some, but uh, there are, the, I mean, local conflict between the dialect group, uh, which they said that uh, the situation is has changed after I mean after the Thailand uh in I mean start to implement the the friendship with the uh, the the China the Republic of China China again. So the situation is changed. So right now they, they feel like they are all Chinese uh descent in that term. So they, they didn't know much about Hakka but they may go back to visit uh the homeland and oh this is our ancestral land, something like that. So I'm not sure that but in the you um, know or the the press that you went to to interview. Uh, what what if they lost their language already? So what they still connected to their as ancestral homeland? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, of course. Um... First of all, I think this may vary between individuals. So uh, some, for instance, Indian Hakkas um, insisted that their homeland is India, not China. And others reported that uh, they are from Major and they, they visit Major and their father wanted to his ashes to be in Major and so on. So some people care for the Chinese identity or another one, or some others don't care much. So I just remember Malaysian Hakka who we asked about his heritage and he said, you go to our tombstone and read and there you will find it. So he wasn't interested in talking about that. <laughs> so it may vary uh, individually, but of course many uh, Chinese for cultural reasons specifically, are very interested in ancestry, have some family history, know exactly where they are from. Not everybody. Yeah. And for the Hakka from Indian, that is, I mean, the thing, the thing that uh, Indian is their homeland, right? So where, hmm, I mean, they, they may stay in Indian in Calcutta for 40 years before move to, to Europe, right? And so in terms of, I mean, for, for, for the Hakka people, do, do they, in, from Indian, 
uh, do they still have the uh, ancestral worship like the Chinese New Year or any any kind of the tradition that they still preserve? Let me first say I think that this ancestral interest always comes with a little bit of delay. The old people, they still remember China, uh, and be it across their parents, yeah, because the parents spoke about China. And the somewhat younger migrants and the people grown up in Austria, they uh, tend to say, uh, we are from India. They don't feel connected to China. Yeah? Because when they were young, they went to India every year. They ate Indian food. They met their relatives. So for them, the homeland is India. Yeah? So it comes with some delay. Whatever you remember as your ancestry, that is the core part. Um, what, what else did you ask? Uh, yeah, the, the attempt to have their Chinese traditions, uh, Chinese New Year, um, what is the name? Um, Dragon Boat Festival. Actually, there's one picture of the Taiwanese Hakkas that was Dragon Boat Festivals, and they managed to have two Dragon Boats on the Danube River. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, there are not enough people to maintain this in a way as you would see it in Asia. So what was Dragon Festival for the Indian Hakkas? Meeting in one of the restaurants and preparing food together and eating together. That's it. So um, it's somewhat difficult for such a small group to maintain a very different culture. They also reported that they put Chinese New Year presents to Christmas because at Christmas, all the European children get presents. <laughs> it would be difficult for, for their own to not get presents. <laughs> then also there is a religious divide and religion can be very important. Uh, the Christians, for instance, don't take part that much in the overall group of the Hakkas. They are among the Christians. And um, the non-Christians, they emphasize more this Hakkaness. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite to Saba, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But as you mentioned that they have the, I mean... Uh, they are very influential in terms of politic, economic in, in, in the, the area of Europe, right? So, I mean, uh, when sometimes when, when we talk about the politics, so, I mean, the idea of the, the antagonism between the European and the Chinese or the and, and others, something like that. So, how, how do they... Uh, deal with this kind of uh, uh, antagonism? Uh, first of all, let me say, I think there are more Hakka politicians in Asia than in, we met one EU politician who of Hakka Chinese descent in the Netherlands, uh, and he was also mayor of some town. Uh, so they some Hakkas, they are all fully integrated and they play a role in society, often they own a large restaurant or several restaurants usually, huh? like this. Um, but they are not numerous enough to be really a group as such in Europe. Uh, what I meant basically is that, uh, for instance, the Tsongtsin Hakka Association seems to be closely connected to Hong Kong, Shenzhen, uh, and this may be more across business relationships, which are maintained in the form of a Tsungtsin meetings and so on. Yeah. I think it is more important in, in Asia um, that especially a middleman minority, that is a generalization, they are usually quite successful. And uh, <laughs> because they do something everybody needs, and uh, so they earn more money with that. 
And this is what Chinese migrants often are doing. They have it much worse in Europe, where they are mostly restricted in the first generation to restaurants. And that might not be a very good business for everybody. It's very hard work. Yeah. Uh, comment from the chat box. Um, someone says, Penang, Malaysia, Hakka, and Shekha mostly stay in rural hill areas, such as very rural. <laughs> you can see from the chat. Moment, I have a look. <clears throat> uh, right, I cannot see. Chat. Show chat. Ah, here. Yeah. yeah, I got it. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Penang. Hakka's ancestor mostly in rural hill area. Um, yes, um, I can mention the generalization that the Hakkas, due to their discriminated situation in history, tended to go to the margins of economic centers and start marginal economies. So it was argued that the Indian Hakkas, they took tanneries and leather production in India, uh, because this is something the Indians don't want to do. And uh, this made them wealthy for one or two generations. And when this was no longer that good, uh, many hackers decided to move outside. This is an urban way. In Malaysia, of course, the, the further back in history, the more the, the settlers may also have done agriculture. But very often, the Hakkas were kind of pioneers. So they, they um, went to places uh, formerly uninhabited, contact to minorities. For instance, in Taiwan, they settled between the Hokkien and the Austronesians. And they played a role there between these two groups. Um, and uh, you can see in southern Thailand, they are rural. They started doing plantations and so on. Um, and only later move over to industrial uh, business. Um, in modern times, of course, every, the new generation mostly uh, is working in education, business, industries because that's the thing everybody is doing. And being a farmer, uh, you need to have land, and maybe that's not what most people want to do. But of course, further back in history, um, of course, they, they were also in remote areas. Nonetheless, I think a majority of, of Chinese lives in... Uh, in urban environments in Malaysia. Penang being kind of an exception because that was English. And um, so maybe, you know, the English occupied Georgetown and then came Hakkas and they looked for a place. I hope this, that comments on, on this. Okay, I think uh, today is a uh, very interesting and uh, you study a lot and many country of Hakka. So I uh, would like to thank you today. And we still have tomorrow <laughs> the last public talk. Thank you very much, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye.